down to the east side, so we're getting into different habitat uh, areas where you've got a lot of this yellow pine, pine rosa, and uh, jeffrey pine, the little areas with uh, sagebrush or other kinds of shrubs underneath. And we get again a different set of species. As you move up from the west side, higher and the other side, you encounter all three of the red finches. So lower altitudes, you're going to find the house finches. You get up on the higher altitudes in the west side, mid altitude, high altitude, you're going to mainly get purple finches. When you get near the top, when you get over the east side, you're going to mainly get cow finches. Of course, these birds all have look fairly similar. They are similar forms. Here is a very characteristic column, which is good to learn. Sometimes you get an area where you can get purple or castle stitches together, it's important to learn some of those, those columns. So, as long as you can learn as well, but a little bit harder to tell apart. You're lucky you might have some red cross fields I am not going to talk about the nine, maybe ten, maybe more. <laughs> but can only be told apart by that home. That's for another, another lecture that I'm not going to do. And there's another one. A little thing with a little pinky noise. Some of these birds are found in the, you know, they're found in a lot of areas on the coast. And then they're found almost not at all on the west side of the Sierra. And then they become common again <coughs> in higher elevations and on the east side. And as anybody knows who's trying to get a look at those, they also like to stay at the very, very top of the tree. Now we spill down even lower into the Great Basin scrubs. Now we're getting pretty much out of the trees. We're getting into the areas of extensive chaparral, sagebrush, areas like this around Mono Lake. And although it's a bird you can find in a lot of different habitats, we use Mono Lake as an excuse to talk about violet green swamp. Gorgeous bird. And, and they nest, in Mono Lake, they nest in those tuple mountains. They actually nest in little cavities in the tuple mountains. So if you go to uh, Mono Lake County Park and you take the little boardwalk out to the edge of the lake, uh, you walk right through these tuple and, and you can sometimes look right into Violet Green Swallow and Nest. It's a really good place. And I don't have a picture that really does justice, but if you've ever gotten a really good look in your binoculars, you good luck. Where you can actually see the, the green and the violet color in the back, it's just spectacular. But it's extremely hard. Typically, if you're trying to see that, you get the, the swallow in your, in your binoculars and you follow it and follow it and you wait until that instant that it turns and the light hits it just right and you can actually see those colors. And Dawson talked about that experience. <laughs> <laughs> the way he described it was. The violet of the upper tail coverts and rump comes to view only in changing flashes, or when catches such visions as a beggar flung <laughs> 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 Well, a lot of the habitat looks sort of like this. A number of different species that kind of really specialize in the sagebrush habitat. Sage thrasher, and like all thrashers, it's got one of these long, crazy songs that I can tell you this song to the California press, it seems more, seems more frantic than the other one. Is that a good shot enough? Another one of the characteristic sparrows, Brewer sparrow, this is a bird that almost rivals specific ram in terms of ratio of bird to song. It's a little bit of sparrow, but it, it can produce a really huge song. The song is, is it's not terribly musical, but it's very complex. It's a series of constantly changing buzzy trills. And I don't have a really long example, but sometimes they will go on and on and on without stopping for a breath. And then we do have down in that southeast corner, we have some tree desert and interesting areas that have a lot of this Joshua tree, a place that you're going to find characteristic desert birds like cactus rank. Anybody who's watched the western has heard cactus rank. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> and then there's, a, again, I can't get away from, can't get away from the sparrows. Sparrows superbly adapted to this desert habitat. It's a really great little song as well. Um, it's black-throated sparrows, capable of, in some cases, probably living its whole life without ever taking a drink of water. You get all the water they need from little dried seeds and things they get in the desert. They're really, really interesting and quite loud, you know, ringing song. I have to take credit, that's the only recording here that I actually made. <laughs> starting for me. And then, uh, arguably, the prettiest of all the Oriole songs, and maybe one of the prettiest Orioles, is one that you want to look for when you're in these Joshua Tree areas. God's <laughs> Okay, I'm going to close with my favorite place in the city. So if somebody told me that, that you know, I had a month to live and I could only make one more burning trip, I would choose to go to Sierra Valley. I go there any time of the year, but the best time of all is early June. How many people have not been to Sierra Valley? Okay. More than half. Take Highway 80 for Lake Tahoe, get Highway 89 uh, Truckee, you go north on 89, drive over the hills, and you'll drop into what is by far, by the order of magnitude, the largest mountain meadow in the Sierra, one of the largest uh, mountain meadows anywhere in North America, and it's just a fabulous place to live. Beautiful open meadow country, uh, grazing land. In the winter, it's full of raptors, rough legged hawks, golden eagles, bald eagles, prairie falcons, all sorts of things, green um, And in the green season, you can see a lot of behavior and a lot of birds that you might see other times of the year, but you won't see them in, this, in green plumage, you won't see them exhibiting these green behaviors. And a lot of birds you might have to go otherwise to the park to see them. You can see it right here in California, in Sierra Valley. So I'm going to give you a little sense of what you might encounter in an in early morning in Sierra Valley in early June. Throughout much of the valley, one of the birds you're going to see in here, and then anything else is going to be yellow and black. If you want to see yellow and black birds, you drive down Marble Hot Springs Road in Sierra Valley. And you can go online or any of the Northern California guidebooks, and they'll tell you exactly where to go in Sierra Valley. It's very easy to do. You can get really close to these birds. You can literally drive down the road, roll your window down, and get looks at yellow headed blackbirds like that. And if you've got a good lens, you can get pictures like that. <laughs> but best of all, you get to listen on this beautiful morning and you'll hear their beautiful musical songs. <laughs> <laughs> Been described as sounding like a bird being strange. <laughs> and guess what? Sparrow. Interesting little variety of a lot of different sparrows you can see breeding and didn't sing. So brewer sparrow I mentioned before. We tend to find the brewer sparrows in, in that area in, in areas of almost pure safety. Okay, so that's kind of their preferred habitat. We'll hear about how the sparrow sort of divide up that habitat. In the areas that are more pure grassland, you're going to find breeding savanna sparrows. Different subspecies than the one that breeds in the marshes on the coast. Sweet little buzzy song. And the best for sure. Now, safe, the uh, brewer sparrows like the pure sagebrush, the, gra the savanna sparrows like more grassland, where there's a mix of grassy areas and sagebrush, that's where you look for the best for sparrows. And it's got a really beautiful little plaintive sound. So you can easily find all these sparrows in the breeding season. You get a chance to listen to them and see them. And then around the edges of the valley, you can find both green tailed toes and spotted toes. So well, what's an example is most of the fellows. This fellow is really pretty good numbers. You can get some killer close views. Of course, this is the more 
colorful, this is a female, fellow ropes have reversed the sex roles. So the females are, are more brightly colored than the males, and they behave like males. They're fighting each other over males, and they mate with the males, they lay their eggs, and that's it. They're done. But the males do all of the sitting on the eggs and raising the young. And so both in plumage and behavior, they kind of continue to reverse the typical breeding. So a great opportunity to see me breeding plumage and watch me breed. You like these little shallow weapons? Children's breed up there? See them do displays and hear their songs. And will it? So, you know, you're going to see zillions of these on the coast of the winter that look like this. Yeah. But they get this kind of subtle but cool greeting for you. And they love to stand on the fence posts. So you can get a lot of the road to Sierra Valley, and you will frequently see willets just standing right there on the fence posts. But what I love most of all is that they do these fabulous displays and songs. So they'll go up in the air and they'll typically do a display where uh, the bird will glide and sort of just shiver its wings and they'll sing their little willet song. But <laughs> <laughs> you heard me know what the duck were trying to shine in. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got a lot of snipe as well. There's some snipe breeds in the valley in large numbers. And they also like to stand on the tent post. <laughs> but what's really cool about Wilson Snipe is that is, is the opportunity to hear and see their their display. So what Wilson Snipe can do, and if, and if you're patient, uh, you're there in the, early, in the evening or the early morning, you have a really good chance to hear and see this whole phenomenon. The uh, bird will take flight and go way up in the air, and it will walk in a circle, and then it will make a big dive. And at the bottom of the dive, it will make this, what people often call it, winnowing sound. <laughs> yeah. The sound will occur right at the bottom of the dive, but they'll do is they'll spread their tail feathers, and that sound is not a vocalization. It's the result of uh, the air going across specialized tails. <laughs> Remarkably loud sound. And again, this is something you can see pretty commonly. A lot of American birds, uh, and they seem to have a real habit in Sierra Valley of, of doing what this bird is doing, is standing there saying, I'm camouflaged and you can't see me. <laughs> and in fact, he's four feet away from the uh, <laughs> never heard that. Sound, it's, it's hard to believe a bird can make that sound. <laughs> Sandhill cranes, probably maybe a dozen or two dozen sandhill cranes breed in, in Sierra Valley. So it's an opportunity to use zillions in the winter in the valley, but you can see them right up there. You can see a great a uh, crane call, and see them do the little crane dance, okay? so it's holding some nest material and dancing around. So, get to Sierra Valley. Wow. Any time of year it's a wonderful place to go. And it is, it is my favorite thing. I'm going to close, kind of close at the beginning. Um, this next little one minute video or so is, uh, is Susan Sanders, uh, Ted's wife. And what she's doing, she's reading the first paragraph of the preface of our book, which we think sort of summarizes what inspired us to put a big chunk of our lives into creating this book, which is really just to hope that somehow it would change people's experience of the Sierra. Because they go there all the time, maybe they learn or see something different. People who don't go there very often, it's a chance to really kind of go prime with some interesting things to look for. So that's what this is about. Susan Sanders, Ted's wife. A day spent in the Sierra paying close attention to every aspect of landscape, weather, plants, and wildlife can be timeless. A healthy bit of immortality captured in a single day. Or, as John Muir put it, another glorious Sierra day in which one seems to be dissolved and absorbed and sent pulsing onward we know not where. Life seems neither long nor short, and we take no more heed to save time or make haste than do the trees and stars. This is true freedom, a good practical sort of immortality. 